Could I have your attention, please? Nobody saw that. If I could have your attention, please, we can begin with our program. And I would ask you to take a look at both screens. Not necessarily because I'm on it, please, God. But if you take a look, um, would you please roll the number of sponsors that we have so that I can pay tribute to how many of them have given to us? Yeah, please. They will continue to roll those sponsors, uh, those who have supported us this year. We are so grateful because this is a special evening for us, and you provide us the way that we can be able to pull it off. And so we're very, very, very grateful. I also want to, for those who are not downstairs at the reception, we were privileged to have our governor, Governor Mills, with us. She had a hectic schedule and went out of her way to accommodate a time to be with us, but then had to move on. But we have recorded her message to those downstairs. And for those who were not there, then here's what she had to say. Thank you, Dana. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in person, and seeing people and talking to people. And I'm sure everybody here is vaccinated, right? I stopped and stopped some on the way down and got my booster, Moderna booster. They put a press release out before I even stopped, but you know. But I'm, I feel so lucky. You know, a year ago, this is the thing we were waiting for, begging for, praying for. When the vaccine comes, we'll all be better. And then the vaccines come, three of them come, and then you hear some people say, well, I don't know about that. For God's sake, make sure, don't take life for granted. Make sure everybody you know gets vaccinated. It's so simple and easy and um, necessary. It's the right thing to do. They don't need to get vaccinated because I said you gotta get vaccinated or because President Biden says you gotta get vaccinated. Just get vaccinated because it's the right, smart thing to do. That's all there is to it. So we went through this with smallpox 120 years ago. I can't believe we're going through it now. But anyway, I wanna thank Dana, and thank members of the Chamber of Commerce for your patience and perseverance in you know, it was um, just almost a year ago that we had some really tough conversations before Black Friday, before Halloween, you know. And um, we were kind of at wit's ends because things were going downhill some. And it was a pleasure to at least have the honesty, the integrity, uh, the experience of this body and many other um, businesses and individuals across the state of Maine. And for me personally to have the experience and competence and professionalism of 15 terrific commissioners. I couldn't ask for a better cabinet. I like to say, and I mean it, I've got the best cabinet in the, st in the whole country. The state of Maine should be proud of people like Commissioner Heather Johnson <laughs> and Commissioner Lambro and so many others. And I know, Narav, Narav, he's got his own candy bar. <laughs> Narav, Narav, Narav. Everybody stops and goes, how's Narav? How do I know? He's not my doctor. But, <laughs> but I want to take this occasion briefly to thank the members of the Chamber of Commerce for sticking to it, for working with me, not against me, but with us every step of the way to make sure we did everything we could to save the lives and livelihoods of Maine people. And because of our work together, we are, uh, contrary to that, survey the other day which said we are the second safest state next to Vermont. We're the first. We're the safest state in the country. <laughs> lowest crime rate, lowest violent crime rate, best real estate, best natural resources, and the best people anybody could ever ask for. We're a great community, and that is why I know you gather here tonight to celebrate and commemorate two wonderful people who are also a vital part of the community of the state of Maine. Um, I think about our friend David Flanagan, and I saw Kay here earlier. Kay, where'd you go? Kay, well, you'll see her at dinner. But Kay's here. <laughs> Awful good to see you, Kay. David, who's 74 years on this earth, was devoted almost entirely to the betterment of the state of Maine. Those deep brown eyes and that um, warm Irish smile always reflecting the sparkle of the state of Maine. A dogged problem solver and 
honest troubleshooter, an investigator of budgets and ice storms and spruce budworm and hurricanes, an expert in housing, I see Joe Wishcamber here, expert in housing and education and higher ed and trees and cybersecurity and model ships. David's talents and intellect are sorely missed today and always. And Harold Alfond, this uncommon man, from high school athlete to, an odd, to the odd shoe boy in Kennebunk, to factory superintendent, to founder of an international branded shoe line with log cabin style outlet stores, long before the term innovation was invented, and starting the first private foundation in the state of Maine, Harold Alphonse set the bar for work ethic, for ingenuity, for family values, for charity and good works, works that always offer, offered a helping hand, not a hand out. And for his love of the state of Maine too, we too are proud to call him we are proud that he called Maine home. And may his legacy and his gifts and the legacy of David T. Flanagan inspire thousands more to live those values across our beautiful state and make our state the safest always, not second. <laughs> safest state in the nation, a spectacle and speckle of the greatness in God's eye. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you, Governor. Words well received and much appreciated. It is now my pleasure to ask our chair of the Board of Directors of the State Chamber to come forward. Cliff Grime is the person. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Dana. And good evening. I got to say, the reception was a great experience that seems to have been missing for a couple of years. And as many times as I've seen many of you on a flat screen, it was so much better to see you tonight in person. So thank you for being here. Uh, I, I also want, to know, want you all to know that we have guests joining us tonight virtually. And so I welcome them as well. My name is Cliff Grime. I'm president of Frosty Hill Consulting. And as the Chamber's Board Chair, I have the good fortune to welcome you all here tonight. This year's annual meeting is very special to us. We are pleased to be able to celebrate the lives and legacies of two incredible leaders, the late Harold Alfond, philanthropist, and Dexter Shoe Company founder, and the late David Flanagan, who most recently served as Executive Chairman for the Board of Directors of Central Maine Power, and Avid Grin Inc. Their leadership and vision have left their mark across Maine in countless ways, both big and small, through countless demonstrations of generosity and philanthropy. In our newest edition of One Voice Maine magazine, you will learn more about the transformative effect that Harold Alphonse's philanthropic investments in healthcare education, our youth, and our communities have had throughout Maine. Tonight's video presentation spotlights David Flanagan's contributions and successes over the years when he answered the call to lead in various capacities throughout his lifetime. His manner was typically quiet and determined, and his contributions were meaningful and purposeful as he skillfully transformed challenges into solutions. We are proud to be able to share these stories and memories with you tonight, demonstrating the many significant ways they worked to improve our state by investing time and money to enrich the lives of Mainers for generations to come. It is now my distinct honor to introduce this evening's keynote speaker. Tonight's speaker is Greg Powell. He's chair of the Harold Alphon Foundation, Board of Trustees, and president and CEO of Dexter Enterprises, Inc., 
which he co-founded with Harold Alfond in 1996. Greg has a long and distinguished relationship with both our honorees. From childhood friendships to business partnerships, it's clear that Harold and the Alfon family place great confidence in Greg's leadership and stewardship of their foundation. Greg is a longtime colleague and friend of David Flanagan's. From their early days of practicing law at Pierce Atwood to serving together on the Harold Alfon Foundation Board of Trustees. Please join me in welcoming Greg Powell to the podium to share his thoughts and memories with us. Great looking magazine, don't you think? <laughs> what a pleasure to be with you all tonight. I'm looking around the room and seeing so many friendly faces, education, business, uh, everything. And what a wonderful occasion to be together again. I feel like I'm at a Southern College football game. <laughs> um, well, uh, good evening. And thank you, Cliff, for your very kind words. And thank you, Dana for inviting me and Alfond and Flanagan families to uh, join this evening as we pay tribute to the legacy and lives of two great Mainers. This Chamber of Commerce represents an impressive 5,000 business owners and employers throughout the state, maybe more. And the mission and work you do uh, to advance economic growth, opportunity for all, and workforce development could never be more important than it is now. So I think, if I may, if I may say so, on behalf of the families of both David and Harold, uh, that they are honored and most grateful for this recognition, even as the pain and emotion of David's recent passing remains with us. Thank you for the important work you do for our state and for honoring these two men. The lives of Harold Alfond and David Flanagan spanned nearly 170 years, 50 years of which overlapped and were lived in Maine within 20 miles of each other. Oddly, however, while David became a highly valued trustee of Harold's foundation in 2014, seven years after Harold's death, the two men never met once in those 50 years. Uh, they only met once in those 50 years, and the year was 2003. It speaks volumes about the character and caring of these two men that the place of their meeting was the Children's Center in Augusta, a place where therapy, counseling, and preschool education is lovingly provided to children with special needs along with support for their families. Like so many things in life, this meeting may never have occurred were it not for a twist of fate, the 2002 sale of the Boston Red Sox. For over 20 years, Harold and his family were owners of the Sox. His great partner, Peter Lunder, is sitting over here in this room, so he'll remember the story. So in 2002, Harold and Peter were joining with the Yaki Trust to sell uh, their interests. And as part of that sale, Harold and Peter and their family proposed, and it was agreed, that charitable donations would be made from the sale proceeds to charities chosen by the minority partners. So as a seller and minority partner, Harold came to the Children's Center, which needed funds to expand, to see for himself the wonderful work that the center did for children with special needs and their families. He was invited by two passionate and longtime supporters, Kay and David Flanagan. While as I say, Harold and David had never met, Harold had heard of David and David had heard of Harold. As Harold and I drove from Belgrade to Augusta, for the visit, 
Harold, who was never very good at names, referred to David as the big boss, <laughs> the man who had led the restoration of power in the ice storm of 1998, the leader of CMP, whose house was the last in Kennebec County to get back its electricity. So, on a spring day in 2003, Harold and David met at the Children's Center for the first and only time. And on that visit, surrounded by little children and their caregivers, Harold, David, and Kay immediately understood their common ground, that they shared the same love for the people of Maine, especially our children and that there is nothing in life as wonderful and satisfying than helping people in need. And so, Red Sox proceeds were used to help fund the center's expansion. That was in 2003. Today, another expansion is needed. This July, at David's last meeting as a trustee of the Harold Alfon Foundation, a $1 million donation was awarded to the center in tribute to David and Kay. In this day and age of discord and divisiveness across our country, we can be tempted to believe that our differences are overwhelming, that they have overcome our common humanity. Harold Alfond and David Flanagan showed us that it doesn't have to be that way, even though, truth be told, that in many ways they could not have been more different. In his youth, David was a good student and went on to college and then graduate school. In his youth, Harold preferred playing cards over studying, never went to college, ignored scholarships, and instead went to work in a main shoe factory. David was a lawyer. Harold was not fond of lawyers. <laughs> David had diverse careers in politics, law, business, academia, and served on some 20 different commissions and boards. Harold's career was focused on making shoes, millions and millions of shoes. David was a man of letters, a good writer, an articulate speaker. Harold spoke in brief sentences, often oblique. David loved piecing together model ships, scores of them. Harold loved athletics. David was a Democrat most of the time. Remember his governor race? Okay. Harold was a Republican all of the time, but gave money to both parties, often to opponents in the same race. As seemingly different as these two men were, they shared two fundamental passions. They loved to give, and they loved to get things done. They both shared a lifelong commitment to giving, be it commerce, public service, or philanthropy. They gave for the good of their neighbors, their towns, their state, and especially for those least advantaged, the little guy, they would say and getting things done was their forte. The things that needed to be done, whether it was restoring power to 700,000 main customers or manufacturing millions of shoes or helping to build out a school for children with special needs, they would tackle and get them done no matter how difficult. And that is the legacy they left us and the essence of what we must do for our state and communities in the days ahead. As we emerge from the pandemic, through the lens of commerce, we can see there are three dynamics of our global economy which pose extraordinary economic uncertainty and challenges. The uncharted territory of fiscal and monetary policy is one. The surging socioeconomic and political need to address income and wealth inequality is another. And then there is China. The complexity of how to harness and navigate these global dynamics and address the challenges they present are daunting and beyond my pay grade. But two things are very, very clear. One, 
Addressing these challenges for the good of our nation and state will require strong economic growth, a mission central to the work of this chamber. And two, economic growth requires an educated, modernized, and skillful workforce prepared for today's global market. Here in Maine, workforce development poses especially acute challenges, both old, before the pandemic, and now. No one knows better than you all here in this room this evening that finding workers for jobs we need filled is an enormous challenge, and that Maine's skills, uh, skills gap and aging population are threatening our recovery. That said, as we gather this evening, despite these challenges, there is great opportunity in Maine and important signs that we are on the road to a brighter and more prosperous future. We are on this road in Maine because we are collaboratively building opportunity for all our people, all our people, at a transformative moment in our state's history. Consider these facts. We are on the cusp of defeating a pandemic that has ravaged segments of our labor force and widened economic disparities. But the, tam but the pandemic, with all of its misery, has made the health and beauty of Maine ever more obvious, ever more attractive as a place to live and work as the lure of urban, more densely populated states has waned. Most people, with needed skills are moving to our state, or more people, I should say, are moving to our state, as remote work has proven to work. New, small, and growing businesses are emerging in sectors of our economy where we can compete globally, especially in agriculture and agriculture. And new exciting opportunities are growing for businesses in the tech sectors including biopharma, as the need to bring many industries home to the United States has become evident. A well-formed plan for recovery is in place, thanks to Governor Mills, her commission, and our legislature, and an enormous influx of COVID recovery dollars has been allocated to help our workforce rebound. Our higher education institutions, many representatives are who are here this evening, are stepping up big time with innovative curriculum designed to equip our workforce with skills in healthcare, engineering, computational science, and AI that are needed by businesses to compete at home and abroad. And our higher ed partners are doing so with hands-on experiential programs and pr projects developed by listening to employers and partnering with them. Our community college system is rapidly growing new, short-term, job-relevant training programs for underemployed and unemployed Mainers. Some 80 Maine employers and trade associations representing over 100,000 Maine workers have already signed MOUs with the community college system to partner in the development of stackable credential programs and then to hire their graduates. And today, our state leads the nation in aspirations and savings for the future education of our children. Over 126,000 Maine children have now received the Alphon Foundation's $500 grant for higher education. These grants and the savings of Maine families and the contributions of our finance authority of Maine now total over $325 million. All of this is only a sketch of what we face at this moment and of the progress, momentum, and investment being made in response. And if Harold Alfond and David Flanagan were here with us this evening, they would be looking at this moment in time and they would see opportunity. Opportunity to give and to get things done. They would call us to action. Action building on the momentum of this moment can take many forms. Here are three I think David and Harold would like. 
And I don't want to leave out a whole bunch of others, but we do have a timeline on tonight. <laughs> if you need to recruit employees or modernize the skills of the employees you have, contact your community college and work with them to build the workforce you need. They're waiting for you. Make sure all your employees are saving for their children's higher education in Maine's Next Gen 529 plan. Put in place automatic payroll deductions and match them if you can. And finally, give to the Children's Center in Augusta. So folks, uh, it's been great being with you. Let me close with this reflection on the lives and legacy of Harold Alfond and David Flanagan. Privileged as I was to know each man, idolize them, and be enriched by their friendship, I treasured the talks I had with each in their final days. Harold, looking out on Great Pond 14 years ago in Belgrade, David, comforted by the sound of Cabo Sacanti stream just weeks ago in Mansfield, in Manchester, excuse me. Uh, what are the greatest gifts in this life we pondered? As different as each man was, each man agreed. There are two great gifts in life, time and what we make of it. Harold Alfond and David Flanagan, as different as they were, would want us to seize the opportunity before us. They would want us to give of ourselves and get things done in this, our time, to build on their legacy and make our state and nation a better place. Thank you for this evening and for listening. Greg? Greg, how do we say thank you? Your vision, your generosity is beyond compare. And it strikes me that when we think of our state strategic plan focusing on talent, on innovation and infrastructure, you have been promoting and supporting these essential pillars of our state for years. So on behalf of the chamber, on behalf of this entire audience, and for the entire state of Maine, I want to say thank you, and we do appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Yep. Greg, let me say that uh, I can't imagine anybody with a more clear message, a more sincere message, one that was able to capture the heart and the minds of two incredible people than what you said this evening. Extremely effective. You could hear a pin drop in this room and the standing applause was really well deserved. And I've got to tell you, he was instrumental in helping us as we took five hours of video to break it down into a much shorter time, much shorter time. <laughs> as well as the magazine that hopefully you'll all look at and most of all take home. It's, um, we like what we were able to do and we sure liked who we were doing it for. So thank you very much, Greg. <clears throat> we have two very special, incredible ladies that are on the platform for us this evening, and we're very grateful to both of them for being here. Kay Flanagan is on your right, my left, and Susan Alfond, the daughter, is with us as well. To both of you, thank you very much for being here. We would like... In addition to the flowers that we present to each of you, we'd like to present to you on behalf of the service that you as well as your husband 
and Father were able to do for our state. And what we do, what we have prepared for you is the Dirigo or Derigo Award, which is the state's motto that says, I lead. And it was specifically uniquely created for us in 2016. That was the year that we had our five living senators uh, at our annual meeting uh, to be interviewed, and it was a special evening. We did it two years later, a couple years later, when we had our seven living governors appear at our annual meeting by, uh, by a film like you're gonna see this evening. So you can see it's a very special recognition. It speaks to the quality of leadership. And I can't think of two people better prepared or worthy of receiving it than David Flanagan and Harold Alphon. So with that, let me say that this is the globe that Harold has, and it's a globe uh, prepared for us, as I said, uniquely by Ben Coombs, who's an artisan out of Woolwich. Um, it is, as you will see, a globe. It, but on that globe is the state of Maine pictured. And we give that award because, to, this, to special leaders because it takes those special leaders to put the state of map in the globe, on the globe, and that's the significance of this. So Cliff and I would like very much to be able to present it to the two of you in memory of this moment, as well as the special people it represents. And let me say that we give this to you with gratitude, with appreciation, with a whole lot of love. Now, Kay, I think that you had offered to provide a comment, which we would love to hear you hear from you. It's not required, but if you're willing, it would be much appreciated. I am really honored and pleased on behalf of David that you're all here tonight. It's really quite a pleasure to see so many uh, old friends, new friends, um, people from all walks of his background. Uh, and uh, it's thank you very much for being here and part of this program. I'd just like to say a couple of things about David. He was a great companion. We used to travel quite a bit, and he was always interested in what was going on. He would do different things. He wasn't just a museum guy or whatever, but we had to go to see every ship, every shipyard in every part of the world that we visited. <laughs> because he had to know everything about the ships that he was modeling, uh, and he would make them and detail them according to their historical context, their sister ships, the battles they fought, and the countries they fought for. So. I was part of that. I didn't learn very much along the way, but there you go. That's what, you know, I was a role, I was a spouse. That's what I was doing. Um, David was a real asset to me when I was doing some fundraising for the Children's Center that first go around. Uh, you know, it was a small little organization. At that time, it's now much more known and recognized for the very good that it does but it was very hard to get any kind of public recognition for just a little itty bitty organization for little handicapped kids. So I said to David, wouldn't you like to be my co-chair on this campaign? Because I knew that if David called up people and asked for their help, the phone would get answered and the answer would be yes. And if I did as a little, little old organization, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked out that way. And so he became a face of the Children's Center at that time. And <clears throat> he has been very instrumental in this campaign that we're going through now. So it's really wonderful what's happening. One thing before we get too carried away about David, I have to confess to you, David never learned how to cook. 
I tried, right from, even be just before we got married, I was taking some classes at the university, and um, he was gonna come over to my house, we were gonna have dinner, it was gonna be beets and I don't know what else, potatoes, whatever. I came home and the beets were cooking in the pot with the potatoes and the meat, and it's like this red mess that was our dinner that night. <laughs> so it never got any better as far as this cooking went. But our marriage for 48 years did get better, and it was a great fun. Thanks. <clears throat> to both of you, it's our pleasure to have you here representing your father and your husband. And we know that for both of you, there was a very important role that you played in each of their lives. And so we give this to you recognizing that, but hope you will consider it with the love, the gratitude, and the appreciation for which we give it. So thank you to, to both of you so very much. Thank you both. Let me put a little added spin to what Kay had to say, which is if you know the couple, you knew that indeed they were more than a couple, they were a partner, partnership. And when we interviewed them the day at their home, which was one of David's last chapters, um, he was fading, it was clear that when we spoke of the many things that he was involved in, um, he would always qualify what he did by saying that, well, as a condition of doing this for you, I have to get approval from Kay. So I said to Kay, uh, so you were the one that really made the decision as to whether he did that or not. She looked at him and then at me, and you won't see this on the film, and then she said, maybe. Maybe that's the way it was, but it was a wonderful partnership, and, and uh, you could tell it, tell it by the way she expressed that relationship this evening. So to both of you, we're extremely grateful. Now we're going to get into the program whereby we honor each of them. For Harold Alphon, again, I repeat, we took a lot of pride, and there was a lot of people who participated in writing stories about their appreciation, their experience with Harold. So we ask of you, we beg of you to take this, to read it, because you're gonna to get to know a lot about this special man that you may not have known prior to its reading. So as you look at that magazine, you will see this. Remembering a main icon, Harold Alphon, those words and a warm, welcoming smile greet you on the cover of our most recent One Voice magazine, on the table in front of you tonight. The chamber has dedicated this year's magazine in his honor to his life and to his legacy. As you read the stories about this edition, you will quickly realize that Harold's philanthropic spirit is as legendary as his business acumen. Rooted deeply in collaboration, Harold certainly committed his life to making Maine a better place to live and work for all. The Chamber is honored to tell his story and the story of his vision, leadership, and generosity. The magazine is filled with stories of appreciation for many of those who are recipients of his generosity. Tonight, in addition to those stories, we are fortunate to have a short video of the man behind the giving in his own words here is Harold Alphon. This handsome arena will bear the name 
of a citizen of Waterville who had enriched the life of this community by giving freely of his wealth, his time, his talent. He's made an advocation of giving young people the opportunity for college education. We honor him not for that alone, but for the interest he has shown in many phases of Colby activity and community service which he has rendered. Whatever you can give, nobody's telling you how much, but you got to give and you got to make your town better, you are got to make your state better, you got to make everybody better and they can't get through on promises. I always like helping others. They all helped me. I won all kinds of scholarships when I was young and I says if I was ever successful, that's the thing I was going to do. And I think I followed it. making sure that everybody, especially children, have a chance in this world. Main thing I want them to gain is to let them know that get a great education and to give back to society what I gave you in some way. got the type of student that I like to help because they appreciate it, they work harder. As they say, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And I think they got that model. Kid going to Maine will give usually more than 100%, and that's what happened up there. Very proud that the college has allowed me to be part of it. And I know that for years to come, they'll benefit a lot of people. All my life, I believe one thing. I've been on a lot of charity drives. I think the more you give to charity, the somehow, somewhere, it comes back in other ways. And the greatest feeling is to give. Thank you, Mr. Alphon. Thank you, Mr. Alphon. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Mr. Alphon. Alphon. Shall we all say it together? Thank you, Mr. Alphonse. It's really an incredible, incredible person with incredible gifts that he was willing to share with others. Don't you sometimes wonder what God-given trait, gift that somebody like he has that spends a lifetime of wanting to serve the state, the people within the state, that's willing to take the wealth that he's been able to accumulate through wise decisions 
and spread it around to serve education, health care, the young people, our community and state. That is a God-given gift, and we're thankful that he was one of us in this state. So thank you, Mr. Alphon. Uh, I now would like to introduce our video tribute to David Flanagan. I would offer this observation as I think about the video that you're about to see. You know, we think we know someone, and we probably do, but that knowledge is limited by the experience that we share. And, or perhaps it's limited by the person's style of leadership, especially if they're a quiet leader, one that doesn't seek attention or need acclaim. Whatever the reason, and as positive as your experience may have been, it barely begins to scratch the surface and tell the complete story of that person's reach and impact. That full picture is what we hope you will see when you watch this video. Before you show it, once again, let me thank Kay because we cannot begin to tell you how grateful we are that you and David welcomed us into your home to conduct an interview with both of you. We are so thankful for your generosity at a time when time was so very precious for your both. As you will see when you witness this video, David's cancer has taken a toll on his physical presence. But as you will also see, that didn't affect his mind. He was as alert, as articulate, as with it, as my son would say, as David was the person we all had come to know. So with that, I invite you to watch a video that we're very proud to share with you and the other 12 people who were a part of this video. Dana Connors, President and CEO of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. At our annual dinner last year, we were honored to present a video tribute to a Maine icon, the late Woodrow Cross of Cross and Shores. This year, we are honored to pay tribute to Harold Alfond in our most recent One Voice Maine magazine for all he has done and his foundation continues to do for our state. There is another person we want to honor this year a person whose impact has also been deeply important to me. That person is David Flanagan, whose service to our state spans decades. David was the eldest of eight siblings, born and raised in Maine. He attended school in Bangor, Hamden and Portland, and later graduating from Harvard University and Boston College Law School. David credits his parents with passing on a resilience and sense of determination. Their example helped shape David into the leader he became. From his early work in state government to later becoming a turnaround specialist, the go-to person whose leadership was sought after in difficult times by organizations including Central Maine Power, the University of Southern Maine, and even the U.S. Senate. Also notable was David's service on numerous boards from Maine General Health to the Harold Alphon Foundation and many many more. To the remarkable work he and his wife Kay have contributed to the Children's Center for Kids with Special Needs. In late August, David shared with the public that he was battling pancreatic cancer. Sadly, he lost that battle. Before he passed away, it was a great privilege to sit down with David and Kay in September at their home in Manchester. It was also a privilege to speak with several people who knew David well who shared with us David's impact on them professionally and personally, and his lasting impact on me. Those people include senators, governors, and other prominent Maine leaders. Leaders who describe David as genuine, modest, selfless, 
a man of great character, intellect, integrity, and respect for others. Driven by a commitment to Maine and what is right for Maine people, a true servant leader. Now in their own words about David Flanagan, the friend, the mentor, and the leader. David is one of those individuals who feels called to serve. When uh, trouble calls and there's a hard job to do, go to David Flanagan, he always answers the bell. He would dig deep into things and, and find out the root causes of a problem. And then turn that analysis into positive strategic action. David is strong, he's effective, he's analytical, and he knows how to build a team. You know, he wasn't threatened by bringing in people that knew more than he did about the subject matter. Yeah, and he listened to them. And then he'll ask his questions and he'll come to his conclusion. And it's usually a very rational business compromise. He's first and foremost very analytical. He may have a big picture in mind, but it's not gonna be because he made assumptions or you did it based on emotion, it's because he did the math. He is truly, I think, the most consequential person that I've ever met. He gets engaged in these uh, issues and ideas and what have you, but he also follows it through to outcomes that can be actually implemented and carry us forward. He does things with intensity. He's determined almost compulsive in his own uh, need to, to do productive work. He really gets into it and gives it his all in a lot of time. No matter how complex the problem, no matter how long it may take. He was always quietly impressive. Uh, he didn't, you know, take over the room. He wasn't loud and, and, and boisterous. He had a really deep commitment to helping the little guy. He also has this wry sense of humor. I mean, he is just a delight. You could count on David in a board meeting to, to break a, a tense moment by saying something really self-deprecating and funny. Never takes himself too seriously. He's a really interesting person. He's really curious. He has a great mind. It's facile, it's curious, great capacity to synthesize information, get to the root of it, and dedication to understanding the facts made for a wonderful contributor to so many organizations and, uh, and causes. For his early career, he was sort of Joe Brennan's sidekick. And, and I think he actually established a lot of his reputation and his, uh, his stature during that period. I always had a tremendous amount of respect for David because of his educational background, but the way he conducted himself, too. And I thought he had a lot to do with the way that made Governor Brennan such a good governor of the state. Governor Brennan depended on him greatly, uh, not just for legal advice and political counsel, but for um, wise counsel, generally. When I was in the state senate for two years, I'd be driving, he'd be writing speeches trying to make me, look, make me look a lot better than I was, which wasn't hard to do for David. When Governor Brennan first ran for governor, we all worked on his first inaugural speech. I found a draft of that, maybe two drafts of it, which I gave to the Brennan archives. It had John O'Leary's original draft, and it had Arthur Stilfen's scribblings, and David Flanagan's methodical changes <coughs> here. Uh, and. I just remember us working on that as a team and what he contributed to that. If David came, he was working, researching something or other. He was a star and he just worked and worked at it. He wasn't very political in one sense. He was a Democrat, but he was really an independent Democrat. Someone that you, you knew was leading you in the right direction. He's a really smart guy. He was just so thoughtful and so analytical and so conceptual 
behind that was a steely person, and he always would make the hard decisions. He, he, he made decisions. You know, he was, he was a tough guy. Not really being afraid of what people would say or how they would react when he knew it was the right thing. He started out as the lawyer for CMP, working with John Rowe, and moved into the leadership just because of his obvious uh, qualities. And it was a tough job. We were dealing with some in incredible uh, regulatory, legal, and, and financial challenges. I recognize, as anyone would, how serious the problems were for CMP. And my attitude was, okay, how do you deal with this? Come up with the best team you can. Come up with policies you think will correct the fundamental problems. And plow ahead with it, even though there's risk. He really undertook um, you know, a decade-long transformation that, that put us on a, on a solid footing, to have a, a strong uh, electric grid, um, one with a lot of renewable resources. And it required some tough decisions. You know, it required uh, an early shutdown of, of Maine Yankee. It required selling um, our, our generation assets. So some really hard decisions that had to be made, um, but they were, they were the right decisions. And, and he was very, very determined to improve the customer uh, perception of whether CMP was doing a good job, and he did. When he was heading up CMP, they had the highest rating in the country for a utility his size. You know, what he did to really um, put CMP on strong footing was remarkable. When the ice storm came along, I think it would have probably been the straw that broke many camels' backs, but David rose to the occasion. Being head of the major utility when five or 600,000 people don't have power, you, that, you, there's, there's no place to hide from that responsibility, and David didn't. Barely slept during that period and was the voice of steadiness and um, optimism. David, uh, just exuded, you know, we're going to get through this. We, you know, this is a problem. We're going to work it out. He took charge of this crisis, organized everyone, and most important of all, communicated constantly. He was calm, and that's important because in a, in a crisis, people need calm. They don't want a leader who's, who looks worried. I've always seen a deep thoughtfulness in how he responds to crises and how he responds to problems at all levels. During the ice storm, we were in constant contact. I, I joke that, that I was a, a VP of CMP and he was vice governor. And I had some situation where I was having a problem with the National Guard, so I called him up. And my phone rings, and I look down and it's Flanagan. You know, this is in the middle of the ice storm. And I said, God damn it, Angus, you know, I thought we were cooperating on this deal, and he was live on Channel 6. I said, I'm sorry, i got to take this call. So on the air, I'm talking to Flanagan because that was the back and forth. You know, what do you need? What, what can we do to help? He was everywhere, getting the resources we needed from neighboring utilities, the federal government, I'm working with other businesses. Uh, and, and then <laughs> sort of a funny story at the end of the experience, uh, you remember Al Gore came, and Al Gore came because he was vice president. He was going to tell us we were getting FEMA money, and as, as he was leaving that day, he turned to me just as he left. He said, he said, Angus, let me know if there's anything you need. The next morning at about 6 o'clock, I get a call from, from Flanagan, and he said, we're just flat out of bucket trucks. David said, we have found bucket trucks and line workers in North Carolina. But the trouble is, they can only go 50 miles an hour. It'll take them like three days to get up here. Can you help us? Well, I said, Al Gore said, what do you need? So I called him that morning and said, we need air transport for bucket trucks. 
and they came into the Brunswick Naval Air Station. I'll never forget, it was like the cavalry arriving. And these planes would come in and the nose would open up and out would come these bucket trucks from North Carolina with these guys driving. But it was all Flanagan, you know, Gore saying, what do you need? Flanagan saying, we need bucket trucks. And lo and behold, <laughs> we, we flew them in. And it was, a, it was an amazing experience. But David was so steady and bing, bing, bing. You know, this is what we got to do. It was a logistics and mechanical challenge as much as anything else and then the leadership of his team at CMP. Due to his organizational and communication leadership skills, we got through it. Leadership matters and David Flanagan was the right guy in the right place at the right time and really, I believe, saved lives. I personally think it was, was a springboard to many other things for him. In life, we have we can have many skills. We also have to have opportunity, and, and that gave him an opportunity to show who he was and what he could do. Yeah, David really couldn't turn away from a challenge. The only flaw that I know that David has is complete and absolute inability to say no when uh, trouble calls. He answered the call. Don't forget, he you know picked up and went to Washington to do that incredibly important job for, for Susan. So when Hurricane Trin Katrina hit, an absolutely devastating storm, it revealed the weaknesses in the federal government's ability to do emergency response. And I couldn't help but contrast the response of the federal government and Louisiana and Mississippi to what we had gone through in the ice storm of 1998. And I thought instantly of David. Now at that point, he had retired. And so I called him up and asked him if he would be willing to come out of retirement, relocate to Washington. And I didn't know how long the investigation would take. So that was, that was a dramatic, unexpected moment in my dubious life. I said I had to talk to Kay about it, but how do you turn down um, a, a major federal responsibility for something like that. He was great fun to be with, even though investigations like this involve very long hours, a lot of work, a certain amount of tension. David kept his upbeat personality, that wonderful, wicked sense of humor, and he knew everybody who came down from Maine. So it didn't matter what the group was or who the people were, it seemed like he knew everyone. And so he often went out to dinner with them or had lunch and uh, caught up so that he kept a foot in Maine at all times while he was doing his work in Washington. When you look at our Katrina, report. It is 727 pages long. He looked at everything, at every aspect, and that characterized his work, whether it was at the University of Southern Maine or looking system-wide for savings or at CMP when he's twice been brought in to do turnarounds. He examines everything to find what is the key to turning this around. And you know, people say that every organization reflects the person at the top. And I think that that's what has happened with David's uh, service as a leader. People called on him for a reason. He is a go-to guy. I don't think he's ever lobbied for a job, I mean. I think it was like 911, we got a problem. Can you come and help us? And he did, and he did it well. Uh, with respect to uh, um, preservation management, 
that's a low profile company, but it's nationwide and it's owned and packed by Joe Wishcamper. I called David, he was just coming off of the, the, the uh, Katrina yeah. uh, assignment that he received from Senator Collins. And I said, David, would you consider maybe taking over as the CEO of this company? And he agreed to do it. And in a, within a, he was there for three years. And then he consulted with us for an additional year. And he basically turned the entire morale situation around at the company and made all of these gains that put that company on, on a footing for the future. That was a great experience for me because they had a lot of successful operations, but they needed to be pulled together. Trying to create a management structure that would work was my major responsibility. David Flanagan was the essential main guy. He had a unique and very deep understanding of the main people. It's so clear that he has cared about the people of the state and the institutions of the state uh, his whole adult life. Uh, he could have gone anywhere. He could have made a gazillion dollars. He undoubtedly had a number of opportunities to go work somewhere else, have a bigger power base, earn a lot more money. He didn't choose to do that. Maine is such an easy place to live in terms of um, travel and meeting people and accountability and no anonymity. Those are all great qualities that I thought were as good or better here than anywhere else. That's how I ended up here. He grew up here. All his roots and connections were here, and he understood the relationships with communities, with the governor, with you know the various people that he that he had to work with. And I think, you know, I, I think that's important. I think that's one of the reasons uh, he was successful. What's the secret sauce for David's leadership and success? I think a lot of it took place in that home when he was growing up, and in those parents. I think at home they were interested in education. They were interested in maximizing the potential of the school that they were attending, and they did. Well, I've been very um, fortunate in having the kind of mentors I had. Um, I sometimes say that my parents were the, some of, <clears throat> some of the um, greatest people from the great, greatest generation, and they, they sacrificed their own careers for the benefit of their kids. I was talking with um, somebody the other day who said that he never saw an event that I was at getting honored or something, that my father wasn't there. You know, they just put their time and effort into us. I thought that whatever he wanted to do, he'd be good at. And if I thought he wouldn't be good at it, I would have said, I don't think so. But I didn't have to do that. He's the kind of person who, if you give him an opportunity and he thinks he can make a difference in it, and it is for something he really believes in, he will take it. He will not turn it down. He just went back to CMP a year and a half ago, or whatever it is. He did that because his heart is committed to the state of Maine, the people of Maine, the company he served before, and doing the right thing. And, and he will be like that as long as he lives. That's the kind of person he is. You know, when we, when we hit a, a rough spot, um, his generosity to come back to really reinstall and reassert um, a sense of Maine uh, leadership and, and presence uh, for the company at a time when you know, he didn't need to, um, is remarkable. And you know, it's, it's, it's bearing you know, the fruits that we expected, having met all the customer service standards, the high, really the highest standards in the country um, that were set for us uh, almost two years ago. 
No company in Maine has a more dedicated workforce, more capable than CMP had then or now. We had a lot of assets working for us and we were able to sort of gang them up in a way that, uh, that was successful. He cares about the company, he cares about the people that are doing there, and he knows that he knows that he has a role to play and he wants to play it. He doesn't want to sit back, even during this very difficult time in his life, in his family's life. He doesn't want to leave the helm. And I just think that's a type of person that he is. And that's why people love him so much. When he took on yes. a similar challenge at USM, yes. he didn't do that because he knew that it would be a fun job. He did it because he really cared about yes. preserving an institution that was in big trouble. We had a need. Uh, we knew we needed an interim president. Uh, we knew we needed to do a search, but that in the meantime, we had a very difficult uh, turnaround situation at USM. I recommended to the chancellor at that time, uh, Chancellor Page, that we ought to seek out David Flanagan. And my re immediate reaction was, go get him. We don't need to talk anymore about this. Well, the chancellor and the governor put him in charge of digging deep and finding some solutions there too, and he went to work and did it. Ruffled a lot of feathers, but you know what? He, uh, he got the job done. And it was one great example of, of David. He takes things on that no one wants to do. <laughs> And he, does, he did a good job. He was not popular in doing the job, but he did a good job. And the net result was that the next president, Glenn Cummings, has been able to grow the organization from the base that David built. There have been a lot of changes since I left, but I think that was a fundamental turning point and uh, very important because getting the University of Southern Maine back on the right track and you know living within its means and being realistic Having an accessible, affordable, higher education is just a, is just a um, cornerstone of any policy for success. The biggest impact is going to be the legacy of what he has taught others like me and people, you know, many, many people in many walks of life. He taught me to take a more comprehensive approach and to not set an arbitrary deadline for finishing an investigation, but to keep at it until it was done. He's given me um, some additional courage to try to push things through. And how to be part of a solution rather than trying to dictate a solution. But also a model. I mean, when, when you think about how to act as a, as a lawyer, as a, as a colleague, as a leader, um, you know, he, he set the example. It's his ability to look to the future and to make sure that the changes, the improvements are going to be lasting. That is his legacy. And that legacy is, I think, currently impacting every single citizen in this state, and it'll continue to impact our children and our grandchildren for decades to come. His impact on his beloved home state of Maine has been nothing short of extraordinary. He didn't just take charge of one thing permanently. He went here as a troubleshooter, and there as a troubleshooter, here as a turnaround agent. He resolved conflicts and addressed conflicts and has uh, addressed deep-seated problems. I believe over the course of his career, uh, he served on over 15, maybe 20 different boards, commissions. He's encouraged me to be the best I can be. And each time he's been involved with something, he's again tried to make the organization be the best it could be. When I last talked to David, I thanked him for all he did to make me get where I got. You know what his answer was? You got me where I got. He was being overly generous. I think that David Flanagan has accomplished more in his lifetime than just about 
just about any other person in the history of the state. David was interested in excellence. Do what you're doing, do it well. Do it to the very best of your ability. And uh, we just need to make sure that the next generation and the ones that follow, have, that there are more David Flanagan's out there that rise to the top of the old milk jug. I think that uh, dedication, fairness, studying the facts, uh, being bipartisan uh, really count, and they move mountains. And uh, David moved mountains. You know, he has a phenomenal ability, so I think he just viewed it as this is what you do, this is the, this is the good life, the right life. He wanted to work doing what he loved as long as he could. That says a lot about the man, too. When you're with somebody like David, you're reminded of what's important in life, and you're reminded to be the best you can be. That Those kinds of people, they're rare, and they lift you up. When you have a friend who is really a great person, it helps you be better. He's more than a colleague. He's a really good friend. He's a great friend. There isn't anybody like David. Not only as a leader or as a CEO or as a lawyer, but as a person. Anytime I get an opportunity to talk about David Flanagan, it's a privilege and an honor. I like to talk about a, the man with the life so well lived. He was very supportive. And David was always doing about the right thing. You know, he's, he's the complete package. David's big picture and quiet hand um, are, are with us, and they're going to be with us for a long time. He was that good. David was the star. I'd like to be remembered as somebody who got a lot of satisfaction out of life by doing more than just making money. But that was never my highest priority. My highest priority was to succeed at what I was undertaking and that it was something worth doing. And that had its own rewards. And, uh, you know, I, I guess that's the way I look at things. Well, maybe this opportunity to thank all 12, whether you're here with us this evening or whether you're watching from home. It was a pleasure to have the opportunity, and it was wonderful to have you share the person that you knew and you had experience with. And as I said at the outset, you think you know someone because of that one or two experiences. What you find about this film are, is the reach that that person had and the impact that went along with that reach, a quiet leader and a wonderful man. Thank you, David. <clears throat> there was a, I think it was the last quote on the screen that said words of this effect, in a gentle way you can shake the world. And this evening we have honored two very caring, thoughtful and generous giants who have shaken our world in many and very positive ways through their gifts and through their giving to others. Giving and gifts that have been transformative with lasting influence for years to come. I would ask you to think about this as we leave this room and reflect on what you may have seen this evening. May the appreciation we feel at this time never fade with time. May we continue to honor their countless examples of service above self with every day. And to the families that are here with us tonight, or perhaps watching, of Harold Alphon and David Flanagan, 
as simple as these words may be and as inadequate as they seem, please know that they come from the heart. They have meaning and appreciation. And those words are, we thank you for sharing both of them with us and given us the opportunity to share their life and legacy with all of you this evening. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for sharing this time. I want to thank our sponsors for being able to bring it to you. I thank again our 12 who interviewed, and I thank my team for putting this together for your pleasure. Thank you very much.